Okay, guys. Uh, so just basically, we've got four sections to the presentation today. Um, just really quickly, there's an introduction, just so that you know I can explain who I am and who the company is that I work for, and what we do. Um, basically, we were invited to speak to you today to just basically give you some insight. Um, really, Bitspiration asked us to come and explain what is the value that the design process actually brings to new business and technology development. So the first section is really short. It's just a little bit of an introduction so you can kind of see some of the work we do. Uh, the next section is a little bit more of a state of the union, you know, how we see the world today from a design perspective. And the third section is really all about kind of how we set our goals, which is really to, to kind of humanize technology interactions. And then the very last section is just some of the things that we're working on at the moment, some of the opportunities we see. Uh, it's a short list. We've cut it down uh, from a much longer list, so it's a little bit more digestible. But the topics we've chosen are really there because they're things we're actively working on, and essentially we see a, a very bright future and potential within those areas. So, first of all, let me just give you a little bit of insight into exactly what we do. So, first and foremost, if uh, I could get you to look at the right-hand side of the screen, I think that's generally most people's impression of the design process. We make things. Um, traditional skills, CAD, all of the usual stuff you expect. But on the left-hand side, you're going to see a little screen. That's a colleague of mine, Tom, who runs the San Francisco office for us, basically. Tom is doing something that has very little to do with physical artifact, and that's really the point of the slide here. Um, the other main part of our business is actually strategy. So whether you're a, a big multinational or a small startup beginning, what we do is work with you to really help build a very concrete vision uh, of what you're actually trying to achieve. So this little circle there on the left, that's just Tom working in a, you know, compared to the right-hand slide, physical product, mouse, whatever, Tom's working on fragrance. So this is a design project without a, a tangible kind of an output, and that's really just there to reinforce the fact that design has really a very, very wide spread in how it can influence and affect business today. So one of the most important things we do realistically is we tune in to our audience, you know, the customer on one side, and then just as importantly is actually our client. So from a client perspective, what we try to do is really, you know, with a, a starting business, you know, do lots of interviews, really get under the skin of what person or the clients or the company's ambitions actually are. And our role as we see it then is really to align that with the values of, of their, their target market or their customers. So, oops, sorry. So that leads us really quickly to one of the main things we do as a business is, is brand building. So this, is, this typically applies to you know, the beginning of a project, the beginning of a brand. It also applies to very established and mature brands who are, you know, for competitive reasons or another, looking to, to change strategy, change direction. The other thing we do is for established companies in product categories, you know, anybody here game? I'm sure there's, there's probably one or two. So essentially, this is a, a major client of ours, Logitech, who came to us about 19, 20 months ago with a big problem. And the problem was that they hadn't done any product in about three and a half years. And that had let a much smaller competitor basically into the marketplace and had decimated their revenue stream. So our client found themselves in a position where essentially they had gone from being a, a number one in a particular space to really falling off very, very heavily. And they came to us with a very simple task, which was, can you guys please inject some emotion into our products because we're being told that our competitor um, is loved by this new generation of gamers and they see our products as, as quite formal. Um, they still love the, the functionality, the practical aspects of the product, but they're just not cool anymore. So that's the kind of thing that we do you know, from a strategic point of view, which is essentially take a category, really dig into what motivates the, the people. In this instance, we were brought in to deal purely with product and after about six months, the client actually uh, asked us, would we take on the overall strategic 
communication for the entire brand. So the scope of what we do stretches all the way from the actual marketing materials, the posters, the logos, screensavers, and all the way over to the actual physical artifacts on the other side. So the last little part, and this is the bit that tends to really excite you know, anybody working in my field, is when you get to work on something new, new product archetypes. So that's the other thing that we're, we're extremely interested in. So I'll just move on really quickly, and we'll, we'll get to the, the main part of the, the discussion. So as I said, Bitspiration asked us, you know, could we come and communicate something to you about the, the value of the actual design process, as I said, to business and to technology? So before I, I get into it, I'm just going to share a, a really quick personal anecdote. And that's uh, kind of what formed a lot of my attitudes, personal attitudes and philosophy toward design with technology. And uh, I guess it's, it's, it's basically how I grew up. So uh, I grew up in Ireland in a, a very rural part of the country. There's nothing too unusual about that. I grew up with mixed parents. There's nothing unusual about that either. Um, the two opposite extremes of Europe. So, you know, we had a, a couple of thousand miles between us. What was a little unusual is that until the age of seven, uh, we didn't even have a telephone in the house. So, communicating with our family, this meant getting on a plane, this meant traveling, this, you know, was, 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 was not an easy thing to do back in, in 1986, 87. So, what has stayed with me for, for my entire life thus far is, is the day that phone arrived in the house. And picking up this crude Bakelite artifact, putting it into my ear, and, and suddenly my grandmother's unconditional love is just on the other side of that phone. So what that really meant to me was, you know, became clear as I got a little bit older. And uh, what design and what technology mean to me are, are basically the, the ability to transcend boundaries. So when I look at technology and the development of things, I have a very specific personal attitude, which is how can I use technology to augment natural and human interactions? So for me, the, the real kernel there is this is technology, in essence, helped you know, strengthen the bonds within our family. So it's what gives me a particularly optimistic uh, outlook on the whole process. So anyway. Um, I just want to say that from our perspective, the, the process is always a journey of discovery. You're never optimized. The world is changing much too quickly. Um, design is kind of like life itself. What you do is you give yourself over completely. Um, you do your very best to make good decisions in the face of a lot of complexity, a lot of uncertainty. And uh, you hope that the, uh, the ideas that you conjure and communicate connect with your audience. So one thing that you'll appreciate, I think everybody kind of understands at this point, is uh, we live in a, a moment in time in which technology really has imposed some dramatic changes on how we live life. So we, we're really in a moment where you have this incredibly diverse set of disparate, <laughs> you know, technologies which are coming in, they're bouncing off one another, you know, so it's, it's, it's constantly evolving, it's constantly in flux. And the one thing that you'll, you, you would know that you ask three designers, three different designers, same question, you're going to get three very different answers. So when you're dealing with, you know, this kind of rapidly evolving, intermixing set of um, uh, technology sets, there is really never only one right outcome you're going to discover that very quickly at the beginning of the process. So what we try to do is look at where the truths lie, you know, and for us, it's, it's you know, everybody in this room knows this, you know, the speed, scale, and the complexity of change, technological change, is constantly increasing. What that means for us is that when you look at this example, this, is, this comes from a really nice, pretty short book, MIT Press, the guys, the names are there, Alan B and Sadowitz. And what the guys did is they just kind of broke down the, the development of modern technology into three really simple layers. So I just want to share quickly some perspectives here. So when you look at level one technology, this is going right back to Henry Ford's car, you know, the, the, the original combustion engine. Designing was something that almost any one individual could do themselves. It's very cause and effect. 
very predictable, basically. I'm going to get from here to here, and I want to do it faster than I could do it before. We get to level two, and Henry Ford wasn't thinking about this with the Model T. He wasn't thinking roads, he wasn't thinking road signs. That car was designed to drive through fields. So level two is really when you start to see the emergence of, of systemic complexity. But the thing with level two is it's still pretty predictable. It's quite quantifiable. We all live in a, a level three technology world at this point. And what that means is that essentially the speed and rapidity of change is just so dramatic now that I can tell any one person here, when you start a project, the world is going to look very, very different when you actually get to the end of that project. So designing today at level three, it just demands a really intense level of strategic flexibility. And it doesn't matter if that's a product, a brand, or even just a strategy. So when we set down and we look at ourselves as an industry, design industry, we accept how much the world is changing and how quickly it's changing, that changes us as well. So the biggest difference that I've noticed, even in the, the short kind of seven or eight years that I've been working in industrial design, in product design, is the diversity of the teams I work with. So I just got back from uh, Taiwan a couple of weeks ago. It was a, a, a gaming conference for a major client. And in the room, traditionally, we would have you know, had your designers, marketing, you know, a couple of decision makers. And that would have been maybe seven years ago. And, you know, some optical experts for technology, sensing, this kind of stuff. Today, I'm sitting in the room, and over there is a, a behavioral specialist. There's a psychologist. The guy up the front presenting some new stuff to us is, is a, a performance scientist with a sporting background. So it's made our lives a whole lot more interesting. It encourages these radical collisions between different disciplines. And, and this is what really, you know, the design process actually brings. You know, for anybody wondering what to do next, it's the richness in the teams that we actually work with now that lead to these kind of really interesting, you know, serendipitous interactions. So there are lots of us with lots of different perspectives working, but we all just have one pretty simple question that we have to, to answer for ourselves. How and what steps do we take to identify actual value? I mean, in a world where so much is possible, where you can really feed off so many different connections, what is it that lets us be confident that the decisions we're making are right? So this is going to take us to a little bit of the, the real, the, the heart of the talk here today, and that's our philosophy, our approach to design. So this is not supposed to be controversial, but at the same time, I just want to say that we, we see two very separate kind of approaches to the development of technology. On the one side, you have your inventors, the scientists, and these guys, they kind of work in a certain way. <laughs> For them, the ambition is typically, how do I make impossible happen? You know, I heard this amazing guy speak in uh, South by Southwest a couple of months ago. Uh, Daniel Kaufman, and he's basically the head of DARPA, you know, the, the US Defense Agency. Sounds a little bit sinister, but his perspective was, was really cool. And, uh, you know, his, the quote that just stayed with me was, came from Alice in Wonderland. And uh, what he was really advocating, you know, from his perspective, you know, DARPA, MIT, all these guys, it's about believing in impossible things and making them happen. And that's one side of the technology debate. The other side, and this is where we work, is a little bit, it's a little bit different. We put people first in the center of all of our exploration. And then what we try to do is attune technology to people's natural ambitions. So there are two forces, two kind of invisible forces working on technology all the time. And, uh, you know, we're not the experts, we're not the, necessarily the inventors, we're, we don't have science degrees. So what we do is we work with the psychologists, the marketing guys as designers, and we worry about your inner world and making sure that technology basically fits to what you want it to do. So that's a little bit of a kind of a, an industry perspective. If we look at popular culture, um, most people you know, who are not involved in technology, they're going to be constantly exposed to two, two radically different uh, views of technology or the future. Um, on the one hand, you have this very 
dystopian, oh God, we're all going to become slaves to our own invention. And on the other side, we're all going to become superhumans. Now, we don't tend to believe in either of those visions. For us, technology and people aren't really separate. Um, they're not separate at all. They're actually the same thing. Um, the invention of disruptive technologies is something we've been doing for a very long time. Printing press, steam engines, cars. Technology radically transforms our society. And it does it for two very, very important and specific reasons. The first one is it offers us ever-increasing power and control over our own environments, over our own lives. But I would say even more significantly is what technology does is it brings novelty into the world. And don't take this from me, this is what the psychologists will tell you. The reason novelty is so important to brands, products, services is because we're hardwired. When we see something novel, new or different, we can't actually look away. It, it arrests our attention, we're completely captivated. Until that moment, we make a judgment. Either I like it or I don't like it, or it's cool or it's stupid. But up until you make that decision, you're, you're fixated. So that's what novelty, that's what technology offers us, is this capacity, this platform, to reach out to our audience and to completely engage them, basically. So when we're sitting around, you know, in these multidisciplinary teams, wondering about what we're going to do, we, t we, we have to work within a framework. We have to give ourselves some, some way of getting from all of the possibilities down to the answer. And one of the simplest things that we implement is this focus on people. So when we start out at the beginning of a process, what we're worrying about is, how's it going to make me feel? How's it going to make me react? What, what's it going to do to my inner life, basically? The first thing that we accept is that no matter how good the plan, no matter how good the idea, an emotional moment is always going to beat any rational conviction that we give ourselves. Think about how we purchase things. Think about how we go through our lives making decisions. I like this, I don't like that. We like to believe we're rational creatures. The truth is, most of the time, we just simply are not. What emotion does is it completely clouds our judgment to any rational assessment. And that's something that marketing and psychology and design is, is extremely and acutely aware of. So this is a kind of a, a tool set, if you like, that we use to vet ideas that are coming to the table and you know how half of what is discussed or conceived of gets put in the bin, basically. So I said we were hardwired. I said that there was nothing. We don't have a choice about that response. And there's a very good reason for that. So when we say focus on people, what they want, what we're really saying is put people's natural ambitions first when you're thinking about what experiences technology can help you manifest. And the really good part about this is it's not complicated. These ambitions haven't changed. Not since religion was making promises. We all want to be smarter, taller, more beautiful, you know. This stuff doesn't change. This is what motivates us. So. These are basically the building blocks that we work with as designers. We try to tap into these things. These are the, the invisible forces that we know are going to override any other rational assessments. Anything else that's going in, on your on, in your life is going to have to come second. And you're not going to have a choice about it. They're like, you know, it's like train tracks. And you, you feel passionate about something, that's what's going to dictate your behavior, not whether you should be going to bed at a reasonable hour, you know. Why am I playing another two hours of, you know, Halo or whatever it is? It's not a rational assessment. You're just, you're in the zone. So, we have a, a kind of a working process for establishing what the, uh, what the audience cares about. So, you're going to hear an awful lot of discourse if you talk to designers about design research. A lot of the time, the output of design research is this kind of document, you know, 25 people said yes, 28 said no, you know, this kind of stuff. I gotta say, we really, we really don't care about that very much. What it's really about for us is building a relationship with the people that we've identified, the people we believe are the, the right target market for something. 
So what we do is we, initially we rely on professional recruiters. They go out into the world, they go to the right geographical location, they find the right people, and they, they search out people who are willing to have us come into their homes. You know, what we know is we want somebody to really open up to us. We're not, we're not actually interested in what people think they want. What we're interested in is what really, really motivates people. What's under their skin? What, what do they get really excited about and passionate about? And the only way you're going to get somebody to open up about that is to have a relationship with them, to reveal what's inside. It's, it's not something that we're necessarily all that eager to do with strangers. So what we try to do is, is at the beginning of a project, is find these people, develop a relationship with them, and depending on the budget or the size of the client we're working with, we'll continue that relationship right to the end of the project. This maybe is one of my favorite parts of the whole process. This is really early on. This is where we're either you've come to us or we're sitting around dreaming in, in our own office about what we could do. And I really just want to describe really quickly some of the tools that we, we bring to bear you know, at the very beginning of a process when it's just questions. Somebody's got an amazing piece of technology, but we don't yet know what to do with it. So what we do is we build scenarios. So a lot of this stuff has come with our initial meetings with people we're trying to understand what motivates them. We go back to the office, we sit with our clients, we brainstorm, and then we go away for a couple of weeks. And really this just depends on the, the, the kind of the budget that a client can actually afford to spend. So I'm showing you the very, very simplest. This is, this is just storyboards, and this is building experiences in like, it takes 15, 20 minutes to sketch something out. No more. You can imagine this as a fully rendered animation movie. You know, it's just budget. It doesn't actually change the value of what you're showing. And the real value of this stuff is this is how you get to test your vision. This is how you really get to dig under, ask all the questions. You'd be amazed at how often what, what you know, a client comes and they have a very, very well established idea. We always demand, if at all possible, that we do this discovery process. In my experience, it has never failed to surprise. It's never failed to throw up insights that just either the client hadn't thought of or that we weren't thinking of. As soon as we get out into the field, start talking to people and building these scenarios, that's where truth starts to kind of rise to the surface, basically. You know, you spot flaws in your logic when you actually work it all the way through from beginning to end. Now, these are just some loose scenarios, but the same really does apply to every aspect of the process. It doesn't matter if we're building prototypes or experienced demonstrators. You know, whether you start with a sketch and you have the budget to go all the way to a fully rendered model, or in fact, in more recent years, the kind of the photo models we get made, these really tangible, they're not real, they don't work, but they're, they're super, super real, they work in presentations. Most of the photography you ever see of product is typically a picture of one of the models an agency like ours made. It's not actually the real product at all. But what these things do is they let us gauge emotional reaction. It means you, an inventor, you know, your business, an entrepreneur, you've got the tools in your hands to go into a room and to communicate your vision. That's what design is doing. It's trying to put the tools, the communication tools, into your hands so that when you've got to go into an important meeting, when you've got to address a small or a large audience, that you feel confident that what you're communicating actually resonates with your audience. And that, that's really all design is. I said it at the beginning. You know, it's, it's about making good decisions. It's just like life. But the output, that's what everybody in the room should care about. It's, you need to look at design as a way of facilitating your thought process. But more importantly, it's how you communicate to the world outside your own bubble. You know? I see this no matter, you know, t people 10 times smarter than I am. We all develop blind spots. We get too close to a project. What design does and asks you to do is to just shake it all up again, basically, and re-examine what you're doing. So really, this section kind of gets pretty simple now in some respects. This is a very simple point, but I don't want any, on any illusion as to how important this is. Let's just say we've, we've started manufacturing the vision. 
we believe we've got the right solution for the right people on the table. The next thing that really makes a difference to the success, the success of your product or not is how effectively can you develop that vision, match it to a strategy, and then just go for it. Now, this slide is supposed to tell you one really simple thing. The process is never linear. You're going to have upsets. You're going to have surprises that you don't like. But the key thing here is that if, if, if you can maintain your own conviction, trust your instincts, trust the instincts of the people that you've brought into your world, don't be swayed by all the naysayers. The important part here is focus, you know, and it's focusing on, on what matters. Now, in my experience, in any one project, there are only a couple of key things that need to be totally maintained the whole way through, and most other things actually end up being flexible. So the skill here is, again, use design to help you identify what's absolutely essential. Because by knowing what's essential, that means you can ignore all the other noise. You can ignore the other opinions. It's not that important. There are only ever, as I said, there are going to be three or four things that are absolutely essential to the customer on the other end and to your ability to align your ambition with what they actually would find a valuable experience, a product, or whatever else we want to talk about. So, it sounds kind of like we're constraining the process, but I mean, that's, that's what it's all about. You know, it's, it's this multitude of possibilities. How do we get to one solution? That's done by putting the right constraints in place. And again, it's not something you should worry about because actually designers work best under constraints. It forces novel approaches. You, you've got to be creative, basically. So let's just assume that we know roughly the direction we're going in. We've applied the constraints. How do we trust the constraints? The constraints have come from the early part of the process. This is the part where we, a consultancy will reach out to the client, to you, the person who's trying to bring something new into the world. And what we sit down with it, you to do at the beginning is to make sure that your ambitions, so what, you, what your vision of this thing becomes, lines up with what people actually, what, what motivates them inside. But how we get there is we start to look at, I, I mentioned this earlier, the rational and the emotional. So we create these, these kind of these large charts, you know, and we, we start to look at what, what are the key words here that really sum up emotionally what matters? What are the key, you know, what actually, for my brand, for my product, what are the four, three preferably, but, you know, four or five words maximum that we can look at and say those represent the principles and the values that this brand needs to communicate to its audience. So that's done really early on. It's done with the scenario building. It's crafting this kind of overall vision. And why? So that when you have to make tough decisions, you're going to be time poor, you're going to be under pressure, there are going to be a hundred different things going on, you're going to be torn in 20 different ways. So you need to be able to go really quickly, actually, is that one of the essential things or not? Am I being true to the vision that we are going to communicate through everything we do, every touch point of the brand, every touch point of the product, every touch point of the service needs to be consistent with these initial values and principles. And that's where you see confidence starts to come into teams. That's where you can start to see, OK, this is our vision. So now we all know it's not about all these multiple questions anymore. It's about focusing on getting this thing done, basically. So this kind of sums up that part of the chapter. Um, it's just a little bit of a recap. This is really the value of design. It's how it lets you connect, basically, the vision that you have with your audience. It's about design having the full skill set, all of the tools, essentially, that allow you a, create a vision, and then after that, this is, this is the most important part, it's how you capture and inspire your audience. Whether that's going into a VC meeting, where you've got you know, your 15, 18 minutes, or whatever it is, or you're actually just at the very beginning of a process, and you're trying to work out which of these two paths we need to follow. 
So that's what design brings. It's a set of tools. That's all it is. It's a set of tools for decision making. It's not fancy. You know, all the, the making stuff, that's the easy part. It's the deciding what's right. That's the, the strategic value of design. So the last little couple of slides here in this presentation, they're basically just looking at kind of areas we're working in actively today. So we had a, a list of about 10. And uh, honestly, we, we, we kind of boiled them down to five because they felt more relevant or perhaps it's more fair to say, more timely. So the sequence I'll show you, it kind of goes from what we're doing right now and then gets, you know, the fifth one is kind of a little bit more abstract, we'll say. But we see them all as being, being highly, highly relevant. So um, I finished my holiday, apologies, um, Wednesday. So I'd, I was in a little bit of a rush to get here. So I haven't heard some of the amazing talks that I've heard people talking about. But one of the things that everybody seems to be a little bit keenly interested in paying a lot of attention to at the moment is the Internet of Things. So really, I'm not here to do very much else other than say that we believe this is interesting. We believe there's potential here. But then to offer a little bit of a, a perspective, I can't clearly talk about the, the work we're actually doing with clients. So instead, I'll, I'll just speak a little bit higher level. So. There's a statement there, it says, explore unexpected behaviors. We're, what, what, does, what does that mean? What I would say to anybody looking at this area, wondering about this area, it's about two pretty simple things. The first one is the IoT is, is on this brink of creating an entirely new medium for interactions. Interactions between people, Existing products, existing services. There's some low-hanging fruit there. The first thing you can do is just, just look at the landscape and go, previously, this is completely disconnected from that. Is there, is there a relationship between these two things that's more powerful than this on its own and this on its own? So it's joining the dots, basically, existing products and services. The second thing I think is, is much more valuable and this is where you, you learn to, to look at a landscape, look at technology, watch how it's progressing. And you learn how to predict things pretty easily. So the easy thing you can predict about our interactions with, with technology from this perspective is, what did we start with? I'm holding one. Remote control. OK, that's great. I don't have to get up from the couch. I don't have to run at the TV every time I want to switch to one of my four channels or whatever. Next thing that happened is we, we start to move into this landscape of action at a distance. So it doesn't matter where I am. I'm in Germany, but you know, I, I can still you know, get on the web and I can change things at home. You know, Nest, you're all familiar with some of these amazing projects that are starting to happen. So the action at a distance thing is, is, is pretty big. It's pretty important. But I, I, what I was really asking you to do is cast your mind out. Try and think about the trend. Try and think about the curve. And if you're thinking about getting involved in an area like this, I would just say two things to you. Think, think about the natural progression. So we've got remote control, then we've got action at a distance. Well, what's next? Well, to my mind, the best thing we could do is, is start to do context aware. You know, is it me? Is it my girlfriend? Is it my fr Who's come into the room? Technology is on the cusp of absolutely knowing whether it's you or me or what's going on based on sensing, based on human recognition. So. The ultimate goal for a lot of this stuff and for a lot of the concepts and the, the people we're working with is they want to get to the point where it's no longer just context aware, but where we're able to set things up so that what you're actually dealing with is an anticipatory behaviors. You know, it's magic. It knows what you need or what you want before you do, basically. So I'll just leave that one with that for the moment. Another area that we're, in fact, the, uh, one of the most in Absolutely exciting clients we're working with in this space, actually from Warsaw. Just, you know, I might have a little bit to do with why we're speaking here today. Unfortunately, I can't reveal anything about, again, what the project is. The, the guys will, will do, do so here in Krakow in, in, in good time. But again, it's about taking a philosophy. What are, we, what are we trying to achieve here? 
spoke earlier about this multitude of possibilities. Again, I would just say, look, look at the, the small text, help life flow. What does help life flow mean? It means how can we use technology to let you focus on the things that really matter, that really deserve attention? The presentation that was on here a couple of minutes before uh, I stood up on stage, basically, you know, there was a, a lovely insight the, the guy spoke about, which was, think of how busy we are with all the chores that we have to take care of. All of the parts of our lives we miss, you know, what our kids are doing, you know. So I would look at this in a very simple way. Yes, sure, in environments are going to become intelligent, you know, we, we get it, it's all fantastic sci-fi stuff. But what it really does is it, it starts to open up a world, it starts to take more and more of the things that you, you kind of almost waste your time doing. And the image is what really says it for me, you know, that's what matters in life, that's what matters in the home not some techy, geeky kind of interaction with a console. It's people spending time together. And that's the philosophy we take when we look at what these new technologies coming in, this connectivity does. For us, the ambition is always human. It's how can I help make room for the things that matter in life? So another area that we, uh, we were working, I guess, for a little bit longer in, um, and you'll all be familiar with the, the first generation of wearables, you know, okay, I, okay. So I'm not running as much as I should be, damn, you know, okay, fine, so I need to get fitter. But at the moment it's really segmented, you know, there are these little, little things I can find out about myself, and that's not really what I'm interested in. I don't care about one aspect of my health or my well-being, I care about the whole thing. So we're all sitting here in a room today, and I can tell you with complete confidence, we're on the cusp of a completely and a fundamental new level of self-awareness. It starts with the body. We're learning really quickly what I put into my body today, what the net result is going to be tomorrow. You're going to see in two or three, maybe you know, four years, we're going to have a pretty complete picture of cause and effect relating to ourselves, and this is absolutely new. The thing that inspires me a little bit, though, about all of this is a big question. We're already tied to so many devices, so many screens. You know, we call these things smartphones or whatever. I don't see them as smart. I see them as mirrors of my own ego that demand this huge amount of effort for me to keep on top of things. So do I really want to invite, you know, 50 new apps into my life? Oh, crap. I'm kind of going, okay, yeah, I should have watched my cholesterol a little bit better there. You know, that's, that's not human. That's, that's annoying, actually, from my perspective. So the question here for anybody interested in this area or thinking about products and systems is, how can I let the person internalize the benefit of the information I'm giving them? Or in a simpler way of putting that, how can I give them something of value that they don't feel is a crutch? You know, it's like, without this, I'm lost. This is the big problem we have. And this is going to relate to another, another topic very shortly. So that, for me, is, is, is really, you know, it's, you're all about to become Chinese emperors, you know, in terms of the support staff, the, the amount of information that you have about yourself. The question is how to make it valuable so it doesn't demand even more and it does, just doesn't become an annoyance that you just discard after a couple of weeks of trying. So, another topic that's, yeah, I, I just hear I, every time I open a technology magazine, oh, products are disappearing, sure, yeah. They are. Why? Because, honestly, I don't care about the box it comes in. Sorry, packaging, guys. That's, I don't mean the packaging, I mean the box. I care about the perfect picture. <laughs> so, you know, again, look at the trend, cathode tube, da -da. Now, you know, l guys are fighting to find a place for their logo. This is natural. We, we reduce things evolution-wise, simply our subconscious, collective conscious, it reduces things to what we actually care about. So this is about the reduction of experiences, again, to what matters. But it brings up another really important point. Devices, Sure, we spoke earlier about how they transcend boundaries, let me do things I couldn't otherwise do. This is what technology is. But it serves another purpose. 
the, the artifacts that we collect in our lives, they become the, the carriers of our, our memory set. You know, there's so much more to an artifact, to a device, to a product, than simply its function. We all know that subconsciously. So from our perspective, yes, things are, we're going to live in environments which are simpler, easier. We're going to have more sensing technology all around the place. Sensing is going to basically get better at reading my emotions. Therefore, our environments will be able to adapt more. Am I hot? Am I cold? Am I annoyed? Am I, am I in a good mood? All of these things, you know, it's already happening. It's already being done. So yes, there is going to be a reduction in the amount of load and the amount of things you need to interact with. But don't forget, nothing really ends up being more precise than some of your tactile senses, and much more importantly, as I said, memory. Memory that gets invested. So we see a future for products, and the future is kind of simple. Instead of having a multitude of potentials, you know, keyboard input's a pretty, pretty old school, but pretty good example of, of, of inefficiency. So yeah, sure, voice and all these things will, will, will happen. But to me, I gotta say, when you think about the potential of, of objects, small object that we carry with us, which is actually context aware. So it's a, it's, it's a simple interaction. It's going to be a very binary yes, no. This is what we're good at. We're optimized for efficiency. But what you're actually controlling, that's what's going to change depending on the context you're in. So we see a really, really magnificent and bright and interesting future for radically rethought product architecture. And uh, this, is, this is getting close to the end, guys. So I'm going to wrap up with one more slide after that. It's a little bit of a, a kind of an ambition. This is the, the final kind of point out of the chosen fields we're working in. And this is driving our UX guys crazy back at the, the office because everybody wants as, as much and free access to the right data as they can have. But we're all overwhelmed most of the time by we're chasing our tails. OK, I haven't done that yet and this. And you get into the office in the morning, and it's the first thing you have to face. It's 15 emails from yesterday. So whatever plan you thought you had going home the night before, it's going to be subject to revision the moment you get in. Data is everywhere. <laughs> and it's constantly, constantly expanding. Um, the Daniel Kaufman guy, again, over at South by Southwest, he, he just had some amazing statistics. Just how much of the world's total data was created in the last nine months. It'll blow your mind. You know, this curve is crazy. So really, this is about how we take a perspective again. What do we think matters? And how do we approach that? So the sentence again, the small text, this is the important one from my perspective. We learn best by imitation. We all know that. This is, this is what we are. We're creatures, we're optimized for efficiency, so how do we learn? We, we imitate. Motor neurons, all of this stuff. Mirror neurons, I should say. When we talk and we think about how we'd like data presented to us, I think about one really simple personal scenario again. I think about medical industry. I think about an elderly person in, you know, their mid, late 60s, 70s, whatever it is. And they're, they're dealing with some serious illness, you know, and they're there, they're lonely and they're scared. And a doctor comes in and gives them 12 seconds and then there's your medical report and it gets clipped to the bottom. Can you imagine how much fear must come from that, that breakdown in communication? So all we're really saying is we, we understand this. We, we're good at imitating. Why? Because we're imitating what comes naturally to us. We learn from our parents, we learn from our friends. We need to present data to people in the same way. We need to present it to them on their terms. It's not a, this isn't rocket science. This is just getting down to the core of what makes us tick as people. So, you know, the medical industry is probably the one area that could benefit most at the moment because it in itself, it's trying to work out how to reach out to individual customers. So I think I want to leave you with that, that slide and with one final thought. And then as we said at the beginning of the speech, uh, Tom, myself, and Andrew will we'll just be hanging around for the rest of the day. So if anything we've said is interesting to you, if, if you have any questions about how design can help shape your ideas at any start, any part of the process, 
please just find one of us, grab us. We're, we're, we're always happy to talk. It's, it's what we do. We talk a lot. So, final one. This is, this is a little bit of a summation. You know, I'll just throw this one at you again. So we made the world really big. Think about this. You know, we went from a, a disparate, a really disparate set of villages, towns, and cities. And then we took technology and we, we changed our civilization into a completely interconnected, intercommunicating organism. And it does all this stuff at the speed of light, you know? So things got big, things got complex. And our only goal here as designers is to help shrink the world again, make it feel small, make it feel human. Guys, that's it. Thank you so Thank much you for listening. Thank you so much. I'll stay a little bit here. That was awesome. That was really good. Uh, come on, uh, since oh, keep the We're microphone here. for a We're minute. We're here because I'm sure there are so many takeaways. I don't even know where to start. <laughs> I was I was I was drafting notes where you were talking. I really loved that presentation because I also believe that tapping into human behavior is, is something that is key, and most most people forget. And, and the power of artifacts of objects. And it's very simple. If you think about nostalgia, what are the objects you remember? There's that that actually proves. What objects were uh, you know, idealized as, uh, when you were a kid, there's a reason we remember objects, a reason we have a tactile uh, relationship. relationship with them. Exactly. Uh, this is the whole basic way, this is the whole, you know, when we talk the world is getting digitized, you know, everything goes digital, and this is the, the, the predicament of content, because we, we used to own a CD, so we had, or an LP, and we touched it, you know, I had, I still have my, Sorry to say that, I still have my old LP collection from Iron Maiden, and I have, you know, I, and I touched them. And yeah, but think about it. You also got to work out where the studio was, who yes. worked. You exactly. Know, think of the information loss that yes. we're actually so. Exactly. Yeah. So this is, yeah. I, this is why I really loved it. But I mean, I, I could talk with you for hours, <laughs> but I want. Is there, has anyone, besides the fact that they, they will be hanging out for the whole day here, has anyone has a question that he wants to ask him right now since he's on stage for a few more minutes? Please uh, raise your hand. I'm, I'm not seeing you clearly because we have all the lights come to us, but please do. Uh, I think she's going to someone, so there must be a question somewhere. There's at least two. And just please state your name uh, so people can hear uh, you. Thank hi you. Hi there. My name is Dominic. I just have a question for you. If you can uh, tell me a bit more about the relationships uh, you guys produced. I, I found that very interesting. If you could just also like expand on the relation, what type of relationships you're talking about? Yeah. Are, are you referring to the, the yeah. research aspect? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So basically, the, the way it works is we, we have a couple of offices in the first place. So we're in Eindhoven, we're in Dublin, we're in San Francisco. Um, why? Well, there are centers of gravity in the world for everything we do. So when we talk about building relationships, think about this. First thing we have to decide is, is, is that product mass market? Is it for now? Or is this idea somebody has a little bit niche and is it, gonna, is it a seed that's maybe going to grow into something? So we, we need to know whether we're talking to a mass market audience first or whether we're talking to a very niche audience. So what we do is, with that information, we come to another professional agency and we say, guys, this is the area we're interested in. And we build a profile of the people we want to talk to. So we go over and back with them. And they start talking to people. They start recruiting and enlisting. And the reason I mentioned the geographical locations is What's really important about the relationships is that there are people living the life that we're trying to tap into. So a lot of the time when it comes to technology, the, peop the sample groups we're using are in, where, guess where? Silicon Valley. You know, that California, that idea, the, you know, the Mecca, the place that's in love with technology. I think it's a really good question because recently a massive change has started culturally, and I'm not sure if everybody's aware of this yet. But all the big mobile phone manufacturers, their markets have just gotten bigger in Asia for their top-end products, not the cheap, the way we like to think about it. So to your question again, the relationships we now need to seek out when working with, you know, it could be Samsung or whoever, it's no longer just focused on the, the West. The world has shifted once again. So we now have to go all about rebuilding those, a lot of those frameworks internationally, simply because the actual pressures coming to us culturally are what change that relationship between people and technology. 
So the digging in, the embedded nature of how we develop those relationships, we go to their homes. So Tom, who was in a, a slide there at the beginning, he's a, a friend, Will Reese. So he's another affiliate of our uh, organization. And these guys are research experts. So their, their training is actually, yes, they're part designer, but they've also learned design research. So when they go to a home visit, like I said earlier, they're not interested in asking, oh, well, what do you want? This is the, the old Henry Ford saying, faster horse. You know. What they're actually there to uncover is, is what in that target market, because that person is a representation of something much bigger, or those people. They represent attitudes and motivations. And what we're trying to do there is just really understand what a person who shares these characteristics, what make, when they get up in the morning, what is it they're thinking about? It's not the mundane stuff we're interested in. I don't, I don't mean that. It's what are their dreams? What are their absolutely, what are their crazy fantasies and ambitions? And that's what we go looking for. Because that's the actual business we're in. We're trying to shape ideas, turn dreams into concrete ideas, and then if we're good enough, we can turn those ideas into meaningful products. I don't know if that sheds any more light on, on, on what you're asking, but yeah, the relationship continues over a period of you know, up to nine months, sometimes longer. Right, so basically you're, just bu you're, you're building personas based on uh, you know, product discovery. Yeah. I understand, thanks. That's exactly right. Yeah, next question, I think is in, in front of us too. And I totally agree with the West being disrupted. I think I've, I, I work a lot with, with China and, and Southeast Asia. I used to live there and we can see, I mean, we don't see it because if you're in your bubble, especially in the West, as you called it, uh, sometimes you don't see it because it's so fast in the disruption. I mean, it's like, it's like an incumbent, you know, think about your guys that are a startup and you're disrupting an incumbent. That's exactly what happens to the West. The West is being disrupted by uh, emerging nations so fast that they don't even see it. Uh, so next question, where's the microphone? I'm not sure here. here. Please state your name, thank you. Bartek, uh, I have a question about the costs of design. So startups often struggle financially and for them it's more important, like traction and other stuff is more important than, than design that may seem secondary at initial stage of product development. Yeah. Uh, do you see it changing? That's the first part of the question. And um, do you see, or c can you give some examples of startups that really kind of invested in design a lot and then it paid off uh, okay. a lot as well? Yeah, so first part of the question. Design has learned that it, it can't just expect to come along and impose you know, the process that that studio or that company has come up with and bang, there it is, like it or leave it. That's just not currency anymore. So, as Bartosz, in answer to the, the cost question, because this is huge, I mean, costs are not cheap in design. But I, I showed you a slide earlier on, which was this kind of, you know, scenario building, all these different scenarios. The way to think about interacting with the design firm is you got to tell them exactly what it is you're trying to achieve. Design firms are becoming deliberately flexible. They have to, in order to survive. The currency now is ideas. It's no longer process. You can't sell expensive model-making process to a young startup. It's not going to happen. Because if they're clever, they'll already be in Taiwan getting that same thing made for a quarter of the price, basically. The value to a young startup is maybe paying for a two-hour meeting with a couple of senior guys who've gone through this, who've gone through business development, who've already done this, and where you sit down and you test your vision. So that would be my first engagement with a consultancy is, no, no, no. You, you don't have to agree to any length of a process. I mean, the big multinationals, they'll keep coming and in answer to the second part of, of the question. I, I showed some design slides earlier from a gaming uh, business. They had to invest massively to turn. It's a huge ship. Think about it. All the people, you know, they've got hundreds of people working. Changing the culture within a company like that does take investment. It is expensive because they need a strategy that they can, they need to be able to give to any agency after that and say, work according to this document and what you're doing will be right for us. So there's a whole lot more complexity that goes on because you're dealing with a massive human network. The beauty 
of being a small startup at the moment is the currency at the moment in the world is ideas. And ideas can be expressed conversationally. You can get to truth very quickly. And that's why I showed you, instead of some fancy movies and scenario stuff, just the, the storyboards. And that, that is relatively inexpensive. And I would really consider doing that. Find, find an agency who are willing to talk to you about the potential of a process. You know, you engage them, maybe a couple of hours. And after that, if you found value there and you, you know, you're getting some traction and finance, then engage them for another part of the process. Do a, do a proper discovery phase. I mean, it's, it's up to you to really work out what it is that's essential to you and do not be swayed. Because I can promise you this, consultancies now have to be flexible. Otherwise, they're not going to be part of the big ideas that are happening and everybody wants to be part of those. Yeah, I think that was a very, very smart. So we, ha we have time for one more, but you're absolutely right about the currency and I work with large corporations and that's a pro and it's a predicament for, for startups because when you scale, by definition, you start getting away from ideas and getting closer to processes because you have to, in a way, to get into processes when you have a lot of people. But that's, uh, that's the way, that's why you have a shot at disrupting at a very early start and he's absolutely right. I mean, I really love it. I could hear you for hours, but let's, let's have one more question because then we have our friend John is waiting here on the sides. He's very happy oh, to be on stage gonna, soon, he's right? He's going to ask me something in Polish, is he? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it will be English. Thank you, thank you for your time, thank you for your presentation. My name is uh, Piotr Peter uh, ah. and I like to ask you how do you convince your clients uh, that the group you choose and you make the relationship with uh, is big enough. So in comparison of many spreadsheets for mm. dozens of people, yeah. uh, how, how do you convince them? Um, thankfully, I don't have to. Science does it for me. Um, again, I had a slide earlier which mentioned this currency of universal human values. So we know that we all by and large, those of us who are well-adjusted enough to speak and communicate with one another, we have the same underlying motivations. When it comes to sample groups, this is something else. If, if nobody's explained this to you before, go, go look it up. Usually about seven people are enough to count for everybody else. Of se seven of the same group, basically. Yeah, okay, yeah. actually, I, I, I can understand it, but how you convince, convince. that it's really working. Yeah. So honestly, truth will out. It's a little bit of a cheeky answer, but I, I can put two things on a table here. And one of them is going to make a client's eyes change as soon as they see it. And one is going to leave people, you know, oh, okay, it's interesting. You know, that word interesting will kill, you know, when you hear that one, walk away, you know, it's interesting. Well, okay. I don't really have an opinion or care. Again, it's, it's actually amazing, you know, design gives people the tools to test that logic and when it's with clients, the client has invested God knows how much of their, their consciousness already in this problem that you're trying to address on their behalf. So you already have probably got something of a long-standing relationship, you know, even if it's only a couple of months. The real way to ensure that the client feels confident if you want, they can be brought in. They can be in those meetings. They can be one of the team members who's pretending to be one of the, the designers who's actually just sitting there observing and watching. So again, it's the flexibility aspect that I would advocate. I don't think it's the role of design to just talk to the audience and then tell the client, this is what we learned. But when, what I talk about building relationship is getting that client and the customer and really, you know, being the, 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 basically, we become the pivot for their conversation. And that, that's physical, not just documents being passed around the table. Yeah, so we like to get the client into that environment, basically, the research environment. Does that make sense? Somehow, thank you. Yeah.